Welcome everybody um, up in Golden, online in your homes, and here in the church in Invermere. Nice to see you and welcome to this service on the last Sunday of October. Next Sunday is a little different. Um, next weekend is this event in Cranbrook and Kimberley with the United Church and um, I'll just show it. Carmen Lansdowne is coming. She's the moderator of the United Church, the Right Reverend Dr. Carmen Lansdowne. And uh, she's going to be the keynote speaker on Saturday. Uh, it all begins on Friday uh, afternoon, um, and then there's a supper and a program on Friday evening, and then Carmen's speaking on Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon. There's lunch, there's supper provided. And then on Next Sunday, uh, they're having a, a service at the United Church in Kimberley, and, um, and Carmen's giving the sermon, um, and it's going to be live streamed. So Sally and I are gonna be here in the church in Invermere, like here, where we are today. We're gonna be here next Sunday to live stream the service. I imagine some of you folks in Golden may meet in the church in Golden, but you can also stay home because it's a live stream service. Um, but you can come here and hang out with Sally and I if you want. <laughs> and we're going to have coffee during the service or something. I don't know. Um, but uh, the big deal is that it starts at 11 o'clock, not 1030. So uh, we just have to remember that it, next Sunday the service is at 11 o'clock. And um, yeah. So there you go. And then the Sunday after, which is November 12th, I'll be leading the service and uh, so on. That's, of course, the day after Remembrance Day and there's the Remembrance Day gathering at the Cenotaph as, as normal on uh, the Saturday. So also then next Friday is this uh, guided tour of the Tanaha Interpretive Center at the St. Eugene Mission Building. And the movie presentation, Red Brick School with a Tanaha elder, pre-registration is required at the, and the additional cost of $25. So Sally and I are going to that. I, I know some of you are going as well. I think you probably received all this information in an email I sent yesterday. Um, and today is kind of the day we need to register. The big thing is they need to know about food and so on. So this is a picture of the St. Eugene building. Um, and uh, anyway, give it some thought if you'd like to take that in, and you can always talk to us uh, today if you have thoughts about it. We'd like to give a shout out to the Mission and Service Fund of the United Church of Canada and the PWRDF Fund of the Anglican Church, both doing very good ongoing work. Thank you for your faithful financial support. Indeed, everybody, wherever you are, thank you for supporting the church and however you do. Uh, it's just different these days when we don't pass the offering plate around and so on, but thank you. Every Friday morning, we have Fridays with Eckert from 10 to 11.30 online. Uh, and we, have, we listen to Eckert and then we have time of discussion. So let, let me know if you'd like to receive a link. So Sunday, November 19th, after ch church, join us to eat pie. The Affirming Ministries Steering Committee is going to host the first congregational session. We'll discuss what PI the acronym means. So Affirming Ministry is us, if we decide to do this, becoming intentional about welcoming and creating uh, an affirming environment for all people, including people of different sexual genders and orientations. We're, we've started our fall book study on the book Holy Envy. So this week, we look at chapters three and four. Next weekend, November 5th, don't forget, it's time to fall back. All right. Um, church calendars. We would like to order church calendars uh, again. Uh, if you can let me know if you'd like a church calendar, I'll then try not to order too many. And... Uh, that's a bit of an issue. So um, let me know if you'd like a church calendar. They're quite nice. I don't know what they, they're always just quite nice. And they, they should be between eight to $10.
save the date. Uh, Sunday evening, December 17th, we're going to have a Celtic Christmas concert here in the church in Invermere. Are you musical and maybe want to join in sharing your talents? Of course, we want you to share if you can, but we want you to come and enjoy as well. And so I appreciate Lisa, who's helping to organize this at Celtic Christmas concert. So that's nice. All right, uh, there's a church council meeting after church today for the Windermere Valley Shared Ministry. Today is uh, apparently, oh, Greg. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, people online, that was a little in-house thing, just taking care of our, um, making sure our dishes are going to get done today. Um, today would, would be called officially Reformation Sunday because it's coming up All Saints Day on, is that Wednesday? Halloween? No, it's Tuesday because Halloween is Monday night. Halloween is Tuesday night. All Saints Day is Wednesday, and so All Hallows' Eve is Tuesday, and Reformation Sunday is, uh, I guess, today. But we're, that's not really our focus, um, but we can just remember all the saints who's been part of our life and, and so on. I'd like to extend uh, you know, an, a greater welcome to anybody who might be visiting, who, who might be just checking us out. We seek to be a progressive Christian expression uh, where it's free to talk, trust, think, and feel, and ask questions and not know answers, and be wherever we are on the journey of life and of faith. And, um, so may you feel that there is a space for you in our gathering and service today. That's a beautiful fall picture there. We've been reading the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission today under the category of commemoration, call number 79. We call upon the federal government in collaboration with survivors, Aboriginal organizations, and the arts community to develop a reconciliation framework for Canadian heritage and commemoration. This would include, but not be limited to, amending the Historic Sites and Monuments Act to include First Nations, Inuit, and Métis representation on the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada and its Secretariat. Revising the policies, criteria, and practices of the National Program of Historical Commemoration to integrate Indigenous history, heritage values, and memory practices into Canada's national heritage and history. And developing and implementing a national heritage plan and strategy for commemorating residential school sites, the history and legacy of residential schools, and the contributions of Aboriginal peoples to Canada's history. We acknowledge and, uh, and celebrate, uh, but we acknowledge that we are on the ancestral territory of Indigenous people here in the Columbia Valley. It's the Sepwepnik and Tanaha people. It's also the chosen homeland of the Métis and remembering up in Golden, it is also a, a community and homeland for the Inuit people, uh, there's Inuit people up in Golden, so we, um, we acknowledge where we are and, uh, and who we're with. And I invite us to have a moment of presence. and I'll light the worship candle.
The Lord be with you. I invite you to stay seated and let's sing this invocation song, There is Room for All, number 62 and more voices. There is room for all in the shadow of God's wing. There is room for all sheltered in God's love. And I rejoice and sing. Today, the gospel reading shows how some people wanted to test Jesus. In other words, they wanted to trap him. Their motives were unkind and their intentions were mean. So today, we will try to cast some light on some of the dynamics that come into play when we, when people, interact with each other. Our opening hymn is, We Have This Ministry. It's number 510 in Voices United. I invite you to sit or stand, um, whatever you'd like. beautiful you know how many hymns are are prayers uh, prayer put to music and, and that was a prayer as well so our words of wisdom uh, we have kind of two but they kind of say the same thing this one comes from the legacy business cultures um, and it's the 12 rules of respect we suggest these guidelines both to ensure a safe learning environment and to assist each participant to develop a heightened sense of empathy and awareness during the process. Be aware of your nonverbal and extraverbal cues. Show curiosity for the views of others. Treat other people like they're smart. Mm -hmm. Listen better by shaking your butt. 
Look for opportunities to connect with and support others. When you disagree, explain why. Seek ways to grow, stretch, and change. Allow yourself to be wrong on occasion. <laughs> Never hesitate to say you are sorry. Engage others in ways that build their self-esteem. Isn't that nice? Share your ideas proportionally. Smile. While certainly not the last word on the topic, these guidelines do help set the tone for an open-minded exploration on the subject of respect. And what would you add to this list? So they very much say that these are 12, but of course we can add to this sort of, um, what are they? they're called uh, rules of respect, yeah. And also in the church, um, we have what's called holy manners, which of course is another way of saying rules of respect and kindness and so on, so holy manners. And this comes from the United Church. In our behavior, words, and our attitudes, we promise to relate to one another with respect, humility, patience, open-mindedness, courage, compassion. We will keep God at the center of everything we do. Each speak for ourselves. Speak for a purpose. Separate people from problems. Allow for full and equitable participation. There's so much wisdom in all of these. I'm not going to speak about them all, but so much wisdom in all of these. Attend to others carefully without interruption. Welcome the conflict of ideas. Take a future orientation. Demonstrate appreciation. Commit to holding one another to account when we do not keep our holy manners. Keep the discussion at the table. Be mindful of our body language. Check in about good use of time. Allow the quiet people to speak with an invitation to speak and sincerely say what we really feel. Time to see if Benny's come to church. Benny the bear, that is. I see Benny the human here. Okay. Oh, there's four chairs and there's four young people. I'm doing the math here and I'm just wondering if maybe... What a coincidence! I know, it's a coincidence. Four chairs and four young people. Does, uh, do you mind coming up? Do you mind? Hello. Do you mind? It's just so nice to have you here in church, and yeah, and even sure though is. some of you are wearing your winter jackets, oh, like, I bet everybody's loving the weather. We don't even weather. turn. Our, yeah. Good to say hi, Benny. Hi. Good to see you, and hi yeah. to you four. Good to see hi, you. People. Thanks for coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Good to see you. So you haven't gone to hibernate yet? Not quite. Yeah. Oh. And, uh, and you're always good to come out of hibernation on Sundays. Well, I know yeah. it's nice and comfortable at home. Hey, but, oh, yeah, 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 comfortable at home. Sorry. I like those things you read up there today. Well, and you know, I, I kind of interrupted you, Benny, when you were speaking. And that I was... interrupt you all the time. <laughs> and that wasn't good manners. Oh, sorry, and... I'm supposed to be willing to say sorry. That's nice manners. Yeah. Uh, yeah, today we're, we're one of the things we're talking about is manners. Um, I was trying to think how we like we have a dog, right? We keep I keep talking about our dog, Benny. My cousin. Your cousin. Did you know bears and dogs are cousins? Yeah. yeah. And uh, and so we got this dog last January, and we're trying to teach it manners. Like when we put the leash on, we get the dog to sit. That's a good thing, good of manners. And what's another one? Um, when we don't jump up on no, people. don't jump up. Yeah, we're trying to teach the dog not to jump up on people. That so that would be good manners. And the other one I think of is when we feed it, it him. When we feed carbon, um, we get him to wait, and then we say okay, and then he goes and eats. Yeah. 
and he eats fast and furious. But um, manners, you know, it's interesting, Benny, I've been thinking about manners. Everybody has manners because yeah. it comes from the word mannerisms. Right, you can and have bad manners. That's right, because we all have mannerisms. And, and we can have good, bad manners, like you say, Benny, or good manners. Although I think that maybe sometimes it's helpful not to call things bad and good. I agree. So um, there could be thoughtful manners yeah. and unthoughtful manners, yeah. maybe. Is there another way we could label manners? Um, holy manners. Yeah, holy <laughs> manners and unholy manners, I suppose. Um, healthy, unhealthy oh, manners. Yeah. yeah. Um, but everybody, so everybody has manners, and because a, ma a manner is a a way of behaving around other people. Or rather, I, bears. Do bears have manners? They sure do. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Um, and so uh, let's try and think of some manners that people have. Like, I find these four young people very well mannered. Oh, yes. You are yes. very well mannered. Um, because um, for some reason in church, I get to speak a lot. And they're very polite and they let me speak a lot. And they're. Yeah, most of us do. They're very quiet. And sometimes even Prince yeah. falls asleep in church and yeah. is so well mannered. And um, but very well mannered, and you're well mannered with each other. Um, so we have manners. Um, what are some other manners that we as humans learn? Can you think of any manners that we have? Like, if you burp, <laughs> um, I guess everybody burps. Yeah. Do bears burp? It's healthy. Yeah, it's healthy because you got to get that gas out. Excuse me. What I say. Excuse you, me. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you ever say excuse me? Uh, yeah, so that would be a nice manner. Um, when, when you're home, I'm interested here. Um, if do you always interrupt each other, or do you listen to each other? Sometimes, yeah, <laughs> that's honest. Yeah, that's honest, um, and maybe that's true with everybody. Is sometimes we listen better than other times, and sometimes we interrupt. Yeah, I think so. And, and I suppose, I suppose when we're working on more thoughtful manners, then we might listen longer to somebody before we talk. And maybe, maybe there's a difference between interrupting somebody and, and waiting for a break. Or, you know, sorry to interrupt, but okay. sometimes there aren't breaks to wait for. Okay. Um, but the whole interrupting, you have to be thoughtful and listen. The other part sometimes in a group is you have to be thoughtful and stop talking, right? And, and I'm, ah. I'm serious on that. Yeah. Like some people right. talk all the time and, it, and other people are being polite and have good manners, but the person who's talking is the one who's not got good manners. Thank you for pointing that out, Benny. Yeah. You've obviously been observing humans well. Um, some bears, some bears just growl all the time, and it's hard to get a growl in edgewise. <laughs> <laughs> I want to think of, of one more mannerism that people have before we break here. Can we think of one more? And actually, I don't have it in my head. What's another mannerism? Um, manners. Um, what the? Driving manners. Whoa. Did you say driving? Yeah. Like driving a car. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, because like okay. people push and shove, that's not good manners, but people drive and shove. Well, honking and yeah. being in a hurry. Okay, yeah. Honking and being in a hurry is what I heard. So people at home, yeah, you mean, but we had a shout out from the congregation that there's manners when we drive cars. Yeah. And um, that's good. Can you think of any other manners? Um, yeah. What's that now? Yeah. Yeah. Careless. 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 Ah, can you give me an example of just being careless? Sorry that it took me a while to hear that. Yeah, so someone's asked you to do something and 
you either don't do it or you do it in a way that you're not thoughtful about what they've asked you to do or whatever and then and then that's just not not it's not behaving in a thoughtful way mm -hmm. yeah so i like yeah. that yeah i like that and sometimes another easy one is when you learn you say please and thank you yeah i mean yeah because you wouldn't just say give me that yeah because that'd be bad manners yeah that'd be yeah. rude wouldn't it yeah okay thank you so today we're sort of talking about how humans can have more thoughtful ways of being together and behaving around each other and uh, it comes from a story actually from the gospel where these these men who were in authority were rude to Jesus and they wanted to trap him and they wanted to sort of like catch him and then they wanted to hurt him and it's like they were not using holy manners you know yeah. I don't want to be insultive of humans but yeah I think it's a good idea to talk about how you could be more mannerly with each other not just people here but like in the big when I listen to the global news it's like wow right. people could do well with better manners thank you yeah. Benny yeah. yeah I often wonder what you bears did when you're hibernating oh, yeah. but you watch the news yeah yeah you're right thanks Benny okay thanks for coming yes. okay, thanks for coming bye. up yeah I yeah. appreciate it okay thanks for listening people <laughs> bye This beautiful hymn. Jesus, you have come to the lake shore, number 563 in Voices United. Jesus, you have come to the lake shore, looking neither for wealthy nor wise ones. You only ask me to follow humbly. Oh, Jesus, with your eyes you have searched me, and while smiling have spoken my name. Now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me. By your side, I will seek other seas. You know so well my possessions, my boat carries no gold and no weapons. You will find there my nets and labor. spoken my name. Now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me. By your side I will seek other seas. You need my hands full of caring through my lake to give others rest and constant love that keeps on loving oh jesus with your eyes you have searched me and while smiling have spoken my name now my boat's left shoreline behind me by your side I will seek other seas you who have fished other oceans
nations ever longed for by souls who are waiting my loving friend as thus you call me oh jesus with your eyes you have searched me and while smiling has spoken my name now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me by your side i will seek other seas lola is going to read our scripture today good morning lola The first reading is from Deuteronomy 34. In Moses dying, the significance of his life became clear, what it was and what it was not. He was the one called to liberate a great people from slavery and to lead them on a wilderness journey to a new way of being. But he was not the one to take them into their new land. That was for the next leader. In all those years of wilderness wandering, Moses and God lived in extraordinary fellowship. Before Moses dies, his divine and compassionate friend takes him to a high point and shows him the land that lies at the end of all that wilderness journey. Does the heart of God ache when such a journey comes to an end? Deuteronomy 34. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebu, to the top of the Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, the Negib and the plain, that is the Valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zor. The Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab. At the Lord's command, he was buried in the valley in the land of Moab opposite Bethpur, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him and the Israelites obeyed him doing as the Lord had commanded Moses never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses whom the Lord knew face to face he was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. The gospel reading is Matthew 22, 34 to 46. In the first part of this reading, Jesus responds to the question, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Matthew again suggests that this question was asked in order to trap Jesus. Jesus responds by quoting from Hebrew scripture, we are to love with our whole being, heart, soul, and mind. We are, not, we are to love God, self, and others, and that's not always easy. Love may not be an act of will as much as a natural fruit when we are in touch with the divine within. In order to live in peace and wholeness, shalom, we need to be graced and in, to be in touch with the flow of grace. Shalom is a Hebrew word, which, Hebrew word which we translate peace. It means justice, wholeness, 
and harmony. It is possible to experience shalom in the midst of very difficult times. When we feel shalom within, we may help bring shalom in the external situation in which we are placed. Through living in harmony with God and our neighbors, as the great commandment requires, we work in partnership with God to meet the emotional, physical, and spiritual needs of hurting individuals and a hurting collective. In the second part of today's reading, scholars feel that the writer of Matthew created this dialogue about the Messiah. It is not original to Jesus. If it is your tradition to stand for the reading of the gospel, please feel free to stand. Matthew 22. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment and a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question, what do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the spirit calls him Lord saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. May we hear secret wis sacred wisdom through these human texts. Thanks be to God. Amen. That, uh, that's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Mm. We just received that this morning, actually, from somebody, and uh, Sally put it in the PowerPoint. So beautiful. I'm going to go... Oof, I'm going to just go off of um, the PowerPoint briefly, and then I'm going to go back to it, uh, if that's okay. So... Um, Sally, I'm just finding this a little loud. Is that true? Uh, yeah. Just here in the sanctuary, if that's okay. Um, there. I don't know. <laughs> Is it okay? Can you hear me still? Okay, thank you. So I looked at the gospel reading for this week, and I thought um, what, what jumped out of me was another story in the gospels of of religious leaders, religious people who were uh, trying to uh, uh, test or trap Jesus. And, uh, you know, when you read the Gospels, uh, some of them are Sadducees. Today it's the Pharisees. Sometimes it's the chief priests. And um, it reminded me of something that uh, I heard uh, two weeks ago when I was in Sorrento with the Anglican clergy. Um, and I, I want to bring that up, but just before I go there, uh, something that my, our daughter, Amelia, actually, you know, she's working in Campbell River, her first job out of university, and, you know, young woman working with other people, and it's lovely to follow her, her story and her experience there. And... Uh, a term that she has used um, is uh, talking to her bosses and, and others in good faith. You know, whether they're talking about salary or other things, I don't know. But she, she has this term, well, you know, when I'm talking to them, I, I, I'm assuming we're, we're talking in good faith. And uh, a, a term close to that for me is goodwill. When you're talking to somebody in good faith, you're talking to them in goodwill. You you're on their side. And, uh, and what people say you can trust and so on. And I'm thinking that these religious authorities talking to Jesus are not talking in good faith, they're not talking in goodwill, and they're not on Jesus's side. They're trying to get him. 
They're being defensive, protective, and wanting to be right more than they want to uh, explore truth or possibilities and so on with him. And it's kind of obvious. That's not why they're talking to him. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint because I've prepared something for us to look at today. Um, and hopefully this will work. So last two weeks, two weeks ago when I was in Sorrento, um, the Anglican Church is embarking on a process where they're going to consult with all pastoral charges, uh, all Anglican churches in the diocese about how things are going and what the future is, because things aren't looking great for the Anglican churches uh, in Canada, but certainly in our diocese. And so they, um, we need to have honest and real conversations with each other about the state of our church and and how we're how we're doing and and sometimes those are difficult conversations so somebody showed us this thing it's called an introduction to brave space i'm going to read it Uh, i've already know somebody who doesn't like some things in it and i think it's limited but i'm going to go on from it but let me um let me begin to read it uh together we will create brave space because there's no such thing as a safe place we exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we all and we have all caused wounds. Now, I don't know if this is language that you're familiar with. The last few years, I have become aware that in the church we talk, I've heard this term safe space talked about. And I like it um, that we seek to create a safe space. And whether we do that in church or whether you try to do that in a council meeting or so on, um, it's, a, it's a good thing. Like if you would say in your home with your children and your grandchildren, I'm assuming a lot of you are kind of older and might have children or grandchildren, um, it's a question, is it a safe place? Uh, when your children grew up, uh, was it a safe place for them? Uh, are you a safe parent for them? Uh, Is it a safe place for your grandchildren? And so a part of us, I think, all wants to be able to answer yes to that question and say, I'm a safe person. Uh, This is a safe home. Uh, We raised our children in an environment. It was safe for them to be themselves. Um, Their schools were safe. Mm -hmm. However, um, reflecting on that, it may be also true that no place and no person is safe all the time. And so if I, if I was asked myself the question, did my son and daughter find me always a safe father? <laughs> um, I think the honest answer is no. Uh, there was times when I probably wasn't open to what they were saying or I didn't want, uh, I, and nor was I the kind of person that they wanted to explore everything with. Um, because almost I would think there's things in their lives that I wasn't a safe person to explore that with. And when I I actually asked the man who was leading this, uh, can you talk more about why there's no such thing as a safe place? And I liked his answer. He said, well, no leader can just pronounce a place to be safe or let me just pronounce as a minister today, this is a safe sanctuary and we're all safe with each other. Of course I can't do that. And then he said, because a leader is not in charge, not in control of all the people. And everybody is different. Everybody has their own agendas. Everybody has their own points of view. And everybody has their own wounds. And so at any moment, Someone can say something from their own agenda, from their own point of view, or from their own woundedness that ends up hurting or wounding another person. And, and so it's like, yeah, I get that. Um, there is certainly a limitation. Uh, 
to saying uh, any place, any group of people is a safe place or safe group of people. I do wonder though, if it's tran transitory or whether it, for a moment, for a time, uh, you might be a safe person in someone's life, or you might have a conversation that feels very safe, or even there could be a group of people for a period of time, perhaps that could be a safe place, but just maybe not forever. You know, it just got me thinking about it. And I've had some kind of rich conversations about it since. So I wanted to share these thoughts with you today. So let me go on to the next slide. In this space, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world and amplify voices. We amplify voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. This space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be. But it will be our brave space together and we will work on it side by side. And so increasingly I'm hearing this term brave space being used. And so um, today's gospel reading has given me um, permission to explore this more in my own thoughts this week. What is a brave space? Um, if we can't always have a safe space, then why then are, are we talking about a brave space? So I, I've had conversations about it, but I went online and I found a resource that I really like. So I'm going to share it with you today and just talk a bit about it. And it's the six pillars of a brave space developed by Victoria Stubbs. And then I've just edited and adapted it for us today. Brave space, an environment that acknowledges the challenges that people have when attempting to have discussion around difficult and or sensitive topics. Brave spaces are created when people commit to actively engaging in the six pillars of a brave space. So this Victoria has written that there's six pillars of a brave space, and maybe there's more, but let's just say for now there's six, and, and I think they're good ones. The six pillars of a brave space speaks to the struggle of creating safety and recognizes the humanness of all involved and the need for individual and collective responsibility and accountability. So, so those are good words. I, don't, I know you're not going to get all of this today. I just want to remind you that we record our services and if you'd like to re look at any of this material again, you can go um, this afternoon, Sally ends up putting the service usually by early afternoon up on our website so you can take a look at that. Okay, so let's just take a look. What are the six pillars of a brave space? And the first one is vulnerability. Brene Brown, and last year we did a, a book study on, well, maybe that was two years ago, on one of Brene Brown's books, defines vulnerability as uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. Brene Brown also states that vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, learning, accountability. When people give themselves permission to be vulnerable, they are making a conscious effort to create space for deeper engagement, both with themselves and with each other. The key to creating a brave space is for people to model vulnerability with boundaries. I like that term, vulnerability with boundaries. So you're just not just being vulnerable, you also have boundaries. You might, you always have to discern how safe is this space for me to be vulnerable. We do this by asking questions about things we don't understand. So when you, when you ask a question about something you don't understand, you're being vulnerable. We do this by sharing parts of our story so that the complexity of who we are frames the context of our comments. The word complexity is, I think, important here. It's going to come up a few times, but it's the complexity of who we are frames the context of our comments. To be honest, friends, I haven't really thought of an example of that, um, but I like it. <laughs> and I just like this, the sense of, um, you know, we're, when we become vulnerable, 
we are being brave to becoming vulnerable. Um, and when we're not brave, then we, we don't become vulnerable and we keep pretending or we keep some pretext up, that kind of thing. So the second pillar of creating a brave space is called perspective taking. Our lens is influenced by our own lived experiences. We must listen to the truth as other people experience it and acknowledge their experience as their truth. We don't need to take on the other person's perspective, but we must become curious about it and seek to understand what they see and why they see it in that way. It's lovely. It's simple. You know, I mean, uh, wear someone else's shoes, that kind of stuff. But um, we don't need to take on the other person's perspective, but we must become curious about it and seek to understand what they see and why they see it that way. We do this by listening to understand instead of listening to respond. That's a lovely term, isn't it? Okay, so that's second pillar. The next one is lean into fear. When faced with fear, we are standing on the learning edge, poised to discover something new about ourselves or others. Step out and take a risk to experience and offer something that might be different for the purpose of creating a learning opportunity or a teachable moment. We do this by doing the very thing that makes us nervous. We do this by reframing our mindset about fear. If we let it hold us back, we miss opportunities for change. If we let it propel us, we move in the direction of change and growth. Obviously, if we're going to be brave with others, there's a certain amount of leaning into fear. Uh, perhaps when people disclose something about themselves and they say, you know, I once went to therapy or I've, I'm going to therapy or I'm seeing a counselor. They're leaning into fear because they don't know what the other person is going to think about that. They're being vulnerable. Um, they're afraid maybe of, you know, but they are leaning into the fear. Obviously, if someone comes out, you know, there's different ways of coming out. Someone can come out about their sexual orientation or um, gender, gender orientation. Um, this is why I need this. What's going on in the church? What is it? Gender orientation and sexual? Gender oh, gender identity and sexual orientation. There you go. We're going to all be learning more about these terms. Um, but there's other ways we come out. A person might come out and say, I don't believe what you believe in, or I don't believe what I used to believe in. Or Anyway, we need to lean into fear. Uh, and if we do, potentially that creates a, a deeper interaction uh, for ourselves and others. The fourth pillar is critical thinking. Critical thinking involves the careful examination and evaluation of beliefs and actions. It requires a genuine effort to critique fairly all views, all views, preferred and unpreferred, using rigorous criteria. By questioning and being open to questioning, we can more easily understand one another's perspectives and allow space within discussions for the complexity, there's that word again, of thoughts and ideas. We do this by being open to the possibility that our thoughts might be limited. Hmm. We do this by not taking critique as personal attack, but seeing it as a way to expand our way of thinking. And of course, that's, that's big. Uh, letter B there is big. Um, often, uh, always is a generalization, but life is complex. And um, when we talk about things, maybe there's um, a human tendency to simplify. And maybe when we simplify, we think we can win an argument or win a point of view or something like that. Um, but if we are open to critical thinking from all views, then we have to enter into the complexity of situations. You know, two years ago, we went to visit Amelia on Vancouver Island, and I noticed a big sign 
Um, well, I mo anyway, I mo noticed a big sign, and the big sign said, forestry feeds my families. And I thought, yeah, there's often, often, obviously a tension here on the West Coast in the forestry industry, cutting down these beautiful trees in the forest. And so, but when someone says, forestry feeds my families, it's sort of like a conversation ender. Like, okay, if it feeds your families, there's nothing more that could be said. I mean, how can we not feed your family? And then actually in a store, I noticed something and then it said, uh, it was like a painted, painting on a rock, like a craft, and it said, um, old growth forests are my sanctuary. <laughs> I went, okay. Um, so that's another, the other side of the argument. One is forestry feeds my families, let's cut down those trees. And the other is old growth forests are my sanctuary. But for people to enter into the complexity of our relationship with trees and so on, we need critical thinking. And that's true perhaps about every aspect of life. So the ability to do critical thinking. The fifth one is examine intentions. Examining our intentions helps us to have and check our boundaries. Is what I am about to share for the purpose of advancing dialogue or merely self-serving? Am I oversharing? Is what I am sharing, saying, operating from a place of personal integrity? Examining our intentions always enables us to hold ourselves accountable for our words and actions, thus promoting a deeper level of self-awareness. We do this by asking ourselves a few questions. Is what I am about to share for the purpose of advancing dialogue or merely self-serving? What's the reason for my actions? What do I want to see happen as a result of my words and actions? The Pharisees and Sadducees and chief priests could have examined their intentions when they were asking Jesus' question, questions. But this is such a good one. Like, what are our motivations and intentions behind our engagement in a conversation even? The last one then is mindfulness, allowing oneself to be in the moment with intention. This may seem obvious, but when dealing with difficult or challenging topics, we can easily begin a mental dialogue that would cause us to be somewhere other than the present moment or wanting to be somewhere other than the present moment. The practice of mindfulness helps us to be aware of our inner chatter and emotions and quiet them without judgment, thus allowing space for the first five pillars. We do this by slowing down, pausing before reacting. We do this by enacting the first five pillars. So the six pillars of brave space, vulnerability, perspective taking, leaning into fear, critical thinking, exam, examine intentions, and mindfulness. Now, I was lying in bed this morning thinking, and I was trying to think, I, I was trying to remember these, five, these six pillars and I couldn't remember them all. So I, I asked Sally uh, uh, this morning, I said, there must be an acronym for this. And she quickly came up with very important manners for church people. So those are six words, right? Very important manners for church people. And of course, church means everybody, but whatever. But V for vulnerability, I for intentions, M for mindfulness, F for fear, C for critical, and P for perspectives. I found that helpful, Sally, thank you. Because <laughs> then I was going, very important manners for church people. The pillars are vulnerability, you know, considering our intention, what's our intentions, mindfulness, lean into fear, aware of fear, lean into fear, critical thinking, and then aware that there's different perspectives, right, perspectives. So there's the order um, for that. So people interacted with Jesus, not in good faith or in goodwill, they were defensive, protective, and aggressive. So the, here's, here's this acronym, acronym very good, um, or uh, what is it? <laughs> very important manners for church people. So they were not vulnerable, there's the V. They did not have good intentions. They were not mindful. They were afraid. They were not leaning into their fear. They did not do critical thinking. And they were close to another perspective. I think this is the last slide, folks. Safe person. 
So just back to what we talked about. I just wanted to share some reflections. Are you a safe person? When are you a safe person? A safe space? So when have you, when have we been a safe person for another? When has someone been a safe person for you, for ourselves? When has there been a limit to us being safe or another person being safe for us or a space being safe for us or others? So reflections on safe space, because not all people or spaces are safe all the time. We need to be a brave person and create a brave space. So vulnerability, intentions, mindfulness, fear, leaning to fear, critical thinking, perspectives. Can we notice ourselves being brave? Can we notice others being brave? Can we practice being brave? Yesterday, you know, I was with a group of people and uh, these adults were talking about using a truck that doesn't have insurance on it, just in a little private residence. And there was one of the adults who actually said, I'm uncomfortable with this uh, and, and it shouldn't happen. And the other adult, another adult said, that's all I needed. I just needed one, one of us to say the right thing and now I can do it. And I thought, I think I just witnessed someone being brave. So I invite us to witness brave space, um, you being brave, vulnerable, leaning into fear, critical thinking, open to other people's perspectives, mindfulness, and so on. And, and I invite us to watch other people model bravery around us as well. Thanks for listening. Amen. Let's sing our next hymn, When Hands Reach Out Beyond Divides, number 169 in More Voices. When hands reach out beyond divides and hope is truly found, each chain of hate will fall away and bells of peace shall sound. And bells of peace, of peace shall sound. And bells of peace shall sound. Each chain of hate will fall away, and bells of peace shall sound. When fear no longer guides our steps, and days of war are done, God's dream for all shall live anew, our hearts will heal as one. Our hearts will heal, will heal as one. Our hearts will heal as one. God's dream for all shall live anew. Our hearts will heal as one. When race and creed blind us no more, a neighbor's face will see, and we shall dance the whole world round, for love will set us free. For love, yes, love will set us free, for love will set us free. And we shall dance the whole world round, for love will set us free. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'll just lead us in a moment of prayer, please. God, you are the more in which we live and move and have our being. And we pause to create a moment of stillness and space to, to feel 
that there is a depth to us and, and in our depths to feel a connection with you, the source of life. When we are rooted in a deeper place, we often are our better selves. We're able to be less defensive, less protective, have a, less of a need to know everything or to assume we know everything, less afraid of another person and their point of view, and just less need, needful to be right and to win. And so we ask for help to be the best versions of ourselves in this world with other people, to have holy manners, a higher manners, a higher way of being with ourselves and other people. And celebrating if and when we could ever be a safe person for another person and aware of when we're not and we th give thanks for this reflection on what it means to be brave in a world that we, we can feel threatened and unsure and small. To be ourselves, to be real, to be vulnerable, to have emotions, to have fear, to not know everything, We'd like for ourselves and others to experience holy encounters and levels of intimacy that feel fulfilling and healing and rich. We give thanks again for life to God as we are blessed people on this planet. We receive so much every day to be alive, to be here. We thanks, give thanks for all that makes our being here possible. And may we be mindful and thoughtful stewards of that which we consume and use. We pray for the well-being and the highest good of all people. That's a big comment. We pray for the well-being of the people in Israel and Gaza and the Palestine and the people affected, the people who are affecting. We pray for their well-being, for wisdom, for newness of ways of seeing things, for brave people in a brave space. We remember what's going on in the Ukraine. We remember those people and the innocent and good people from Russia who are drawn into this situation. And we may think of other places around the world that aren't in the news as much, but we know the human family, there's always struggles and challenges that face people wherever they are. And close to home, we may have people in our lives, in our families, in our neighborhoods, our communities, 
our church and their particular struggles, challenges. We think of them and we pray for their well-being and highest good. And continue to be with you in our own way in a time of silence. Thank you for the fullness of life that we are a part of and that we can feel filling us. We are in you and you are in us as you are in everyone and everything. We give thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is called by Earth and Sky, number 135 and more voices. Called by earth and sky, promise of hope held high. This is our sacred living trust, treasure of life, say. sky. Precious these waters, endless seas, deep oceans dream, waters of healing, rivers of rain, the wash of love again. Called by earth and sky, promise of sacred living trust, treasure of life sanctified, called by earth and sky. Precious this gift, the air we breathe, wind born and free, breath of the Spirit blows through this place. Our gathering and our grace, called by earth and sky, promise of hope held high. This is our sacred living trust, treasure of life sanctified, called by earth and sky. Precious this mountain, ancient sands, vast, fragile land, seeds of our awakening, rooted and strong, creation's faithful song, called by earth and sky, promise of hope. sacred living trust, treasure of life sanctified, called by earth and sky. Precious the fire that lights our way, bright dawning day, fire of passion, sorrows undone. Our faith and justice one, called by earth and sky, promise of hope held high. This is our sacred living trust.
treasure of life sanctify called by earth and sky called by earth and sky there are people in our lives in homes, in stores, in parkways, in meeting places, in church. People can be a joy to us and they can be a challenge for us. Each time we interact with a person is a spiritual classroom for us. Can we be aware of what is going on underneath and on the surface in us and in them? Can we be aware of their energy, of our energy, of power dynamics between us, of needs and anxieties, of comfort levels? of discomfort levels? Can we accept and allow what is in that moment? Can we be present in that moment? Can we treat them as a holy guest and find that for a moment we are a holy host? We live in God's love now, and in God's love we shall always remain. Amen.